am Chris Redfield. Punch <laughs> <laughs> bowlers. Hey guys, it's me. Today, we're in for a special treat. Because we're going to be talking about one of my favorite video game franchises that isn't Devil May Cry. Well, it's really more like we're talking about Devil May Cry's cousin. I guess? Yeah. The Resident Evil series is the poster child of Capcom after they slaughtered the Mega Man franchise. I know a lot of people feel this way, but I only got into the Resident Evil hype train very recently. And by very recently, I mean literally a year ago. Over the past year, I've gone through every mainline Resident Evil game, and with Resident Evil 8 just around the corner, I thought this would be the perfect time to gush about one of my new favorite video game franchises. One of the things that I find the most interesting about this series is that everybody has a gradually different opinion about it. Everybody I've talked to about it has a different favorite and least favorite Resident Evil game. So just keep in mind that these are my thoughts on the series as someone who recently got into Resident Evil. I should also preface that I haven't played any of the spin-off games, and I also haven't played the OG 1-3 through three titles. I did play the remakes, and maybe someday I'll go through the original games when I have more time, and I find a copy on a system that I can play on. So buckle up and get your boulder punching gloves ready, because there's going to be some hot takes in here. These are my thoughts on the mainline Resident Evil titles, starting with the remake of Resident Evil 1. Resident Evil 1 was actually pretty good. I mean, go figure. Now before we start, I should disclose that this was the last game I played in the Resident Evil series. I started with 2 Remake and worked my way up, but I think much like playing the first DMC game after playing through 3 and 4, I grew an appreciation for the roots of the series and it was interesting to see the beginning and how they would gradually build on top of it. However, I can now definitively say that I prefer playing this series in third person over the forced camera angles, especially when it comes to combat. Even though all the Resident Evil games are about survival and not necessarily about killing every single zombie, I killed pretty much every enemy on my first run of these games. If I went through it a second time, it was more about going through it as quickly and efficiently as possible. I couldn't do that in this game because combat encounters are not very good. I didn't find out until about halfway through the game that headshots were basically RNG unless you had the shotgun. So trying to work around aiming up and shooting at the right time to hit a zombie in the face left me very frustrated. I should also say that it's not like I ran out of ammo or anything. I had plenty of it to spare, but I felt like combat was such a non-option to the point where I just tried juking my way around enemies unless they were standing in my way. I also have to say that the backtracking in this game was fucking annoying. Jill, what the fuck do you mean it's too dark to see much of anything? Fuck you, Richard. Why didn't you tell me? Oh, by the way, Jill, um, you're gonna need that lighter. So make sure you have it when you go to that save room real quick, or else you're gonna have to walk your happy ass all the way back over there to the goddamn safe room because you, you, And this is also a good time to bring up the door animations. I thought it was a cute thing to experience after not having them in any of the other games, but holy shit, did they overstay their welcome. Around the time when I had access to the whole mansion and I had to constantly go back and forth from the item box to the other side of the mansion, back to an item box, go to the other side of the mansion again, get a key, explore every single locked room because the game doesn't show you which key you need on your map after you see it's locked and seeing a door transition every five seconds, it was just, it, it was just too much, too much. It, it, it got annoying. If I go back and play this game again, I already know I'm using a door remover mod because I just got so sick of it especially when I was already lost and frustrated. One of the things that I think separates this from the other Resident Evil games, however, are the puzzles. There's a ton of different puzzle items that you can pick up way earlier than you need to. So you can either make a mental note of it and hope you don't forget about it when you need it, or you can take it with you and risk not being able to pick up something more important if you don't have access to an item box. While I consider the other Resident Evils as survival horror games with some action and puzzles, this is really more of a survival puzzle game if you ask me. I also really liked all the different paths you can take depending on what you do in your campaign. You can heal Richard from the snake bite and he'll help you out in the fight against it. A lot of people told me about the infamous Jill sandwich scene with Barry, but I skipped it because I immediately put the shotgun back once I saw the ceiling start to go down. So I had to get it the hard way. You can literally skip an entire boss fight if you do a puzzle before you fight it. And you know what I just realized? You can skip the fucking snake fight too. 
You could just grab the item and leave the room. Speaking of bosses, this is another aspect of the game that really disappointed me. They weren't really that difficult and not super imposing. Even the final boss, honestly, I feel confident that I would have beaten it in my first try if I knew that it was going to kill me in caution. I think that finding and exploring the eyeball weak points are a little more engaging and tension filled rather than just unloading everything you have and dodging appropriately. Again, this game isn't really about its notable bosses, but it's something that stood out to me. I will say that I think I would have enjoyed my first playthrough a little bit more if it was just a tad shorter. By the time I got down to the lab, I was pretty much content and I thought it dragged just a little bit at the end. Especially when the exploding canister, which I died to. Multiple times. Good Crimson Head. Bad Crimson Head. <laughs> okay. I don't know, by the time I got there, I feel like I got the full experience and it just dragged on a little bit at the end, at least for me. But overall, I do think that this game was pretty good. I'm glad I played it and it was fun to go back and see Resident Evil when it had almost no action in it. So I'm going to give the Resident Evil remake a six out of 10. Now let's move on to the other remake. Resident Evil 2 is fucking awesome. I did not expect to like this game as much as I did. It had a lot of hype surrounding it, and I was low-key pissed that this got a Game of the Year nomination instead of DMC5, but after playing it, I fully understood what Resident Evil was about. Just like the first game, this game has two scenarios. First, we have Leon Kennedy, who is having the worst first day on the job in the middle of a zombie outbreak. Leon is such a relatable protagonist. He's an honest and real dude who was put into this horrible situation and now has no choice but to survive. And I love how much he diffuses the tension by talking to himself and quipping constantly. This is not how I imagined my first day. <laughs> there it is. We also have Claire Redfield, who is looking for her brother Chris, but instead finds a mysterious little girl named Sherry, who is connected to the antagonist somehow. Her quest then changes to help protect and save Sherry from all the horrible people in her life. Now the canon order is playing Claire first and Leon second, but I did my first playthrough the other way around, and it doesn't really matter all too much. Leon and Claire still have their exclusive parts of the story, but the changing campaigns, which I'll refer to from now as A and B, change the routing of the game tremendously. For example, in the A scenario, you find a notebook that tells you the combinations that you need for all three statues to get the medallions. But in the B scenario, it will only give you parts of it and you need to explore around to find the rest of them, while also switching up the order. So if you remember the order from the first campaign, it won't work a second time. This is awesome because once you play through the A campaign, you get pretty comfortable with the layouts of the area, especially if you 100% everything like I did. But now your prior knowledge of the item placements won't help you, as all the puzzles and how you get all the items are different. But there are some things in both campaigns that are exactly the same, and it's a tad odd because these are supposed to be two different scenarios. For example, in A, you meet Marvin, but not in B as he's turned into a zombie. Rest in peace, Marvin. But in both campaigns, you fight the exact same Birkin bosses in the exact same way, in the exact same place. It's a small nitpick, but I thought it was kind of weird as they did a really good job in making sure all of the puzzles in the areas had to be done differently, but all of the boss fights are exactly the same. The tension that's put into this game is also incredible. I love the third person perspective because it puts myself closer to the situation, rather than just being an onlooker from the fixed camera angles. And while this game's combat still consists of just shooting, knifing, and using some items, I felt like there was a little bit more skill involved. Even though some enemies take longer than others, I felt more accomplished at getting consistent headshots and eventually figuring out which zombies I can just ignore and get around without using any resources. I also really liked all the different enemy types. We have your basic zombies, the terrifying lickers, and much more that all have different strategies to be taken down. This game's puzzles are also really good, and I love how there wasn't much backtracking here. You explore each area fully, once you get in there. And if you want to backtrack for something, it's more of an option to get a good upgrade for a weapon you already have or obtained later on, rather than a necessary chore to progress to the next section. Now I can't talk about Resident Evil 2 without talking about everybody's favorite character. And this character is what took this game to the next level for me. And that character is Mr. X. X give it to you. About halfway through the first campaign, you're introduced to a big and menacing tyrant who stalks you while you're trying to navigate around. This adds a whole new dimension to navigating the RPD, because now that you're familiar enough with the environment, you have a constant threat who is able to follow you into other rooms and even break through some walls. His AI is also really good. 
If you're running or you shoot your guns, he's able to pinpoint your location and find you faster. Now he's not really super fast, so if you're running the whole time, he's not going to catch up with you. But there are set intervals where he'll just show up and you have to get around him. Give me a fucking break. There are also a few rooms Mr. X can't go into, like the save room and some of the puzzle rooms. Which makes sense because if you were trying to solve a puzzle and this goon came in to smack you around, that would be kind of annoying. Now while Mr. X is manageable on his own, he becomes a bigger problem when he's accompanied by other zombies. In the B scenario especially, he shows up really early. And there was an instance where I was trapped in a hallway with zombies, a liquor, and Mr. X. It was not pretty. And this was a problem that I had with the game in general, but no matter whose campaign it was, I did not enjoy the B scenario. I felt pretty overwhelmed at times with the combination of new puzzles, a barrage of enemies, and Mr. X coming in to clothesline you. But if I'm being honest, the only time this was really a problem was in the RPD. Once I got out of there, I think everything was fine. And honestly, that was my only real issue with this game. It's a good length for both campaigns, clocking in at about 15 hours for both of them, and adding another 10 or so for switching which campaign you play first and doing a second playthrough. It has amazing replay value, and I honestly want to try and speedrun it one of these days just to see how I do. But if you're hesitant on getting into the Resident Evil series, I would highly recommend playing this one first. That's what I did, and this game alone made me motivated to play through the rest of the series. So I'm going to give Resident Evil 2 Remake a solid 9 out of 10. Resident Evil 3 came out just over a year after Resident Evil 2, and only a few months after I played through it. So my expectations for it were pretty high, and I gotta say, this game really disappointed me. This game takes place around the same time as Resident Evil 2. Jill Valentine wakes up to find the city overrun by zombies, and a giant tyrant codenamed Nemesis is trying to kill her. She meets up with this dude named Carlos, who's part of a division of Umbrella, and he has his own mission, but helps Jill out with her giant monster problem. Now before we get into this, I need to start with a quick disclaimer. After beating RE2 on standard twice, I thought I'd step it up a notch and play this game on hardcore. I was advised against it, but I said fuck it, and I went for it, and I really wish I listened. I died 28 times and I was pretty over it by the time I reached the clock tower and it just got worse from there. My first playthrough was miserable so I decided if I was going to do this review I'd need to go back and play it on standard to give it a fair critique and even on standard I still had some problems with it. Now I have a lot of bad things to say about this game but I'll start with the things that I liked. I think that the opening sections in Raccoon City are really good. We only got to see glimpses of the outbreak in the city during RE2, so it's awesome we got to go into the streets and experience the chaos firsthand. It really feels like what a zombie outbreak in a city would be like, and I think overall the entire design of Raccoon City looks really cool. I also liked the new mechanics they gave to Jill and Carlos respectively. Jill gets a dodge that when executed as a zombie lunges will cause her to dodge forward away from the zombie. She can also aim right afterwards in which time for a free shot. She can chain three of these to Together, and the last one has a huge amount of end lag, which will punish you for relying on it too much or using it incorrectly. However, this can be used to your advantage to get through an area faster, as interacting with interactable objects after the last dodge will cancel the ending animation. I like little tech like this because it turns what would be a huge disadvantage into a useful mechanic when utilized a certain way. Carlos, on the other hand, will get a haymaker punch that sends your enemies flying. It was kind of tricky to get these down at first, but once you get the hang of it, they become super useful. And honestly, that's pretty much it. So now let's move on to the stuff that I didn't like. First of all, this game runs like shit. The footage you're seeing is from my second playthrough on my PS5, from what I think is a stable 60 FPS. But I found out recently that this game frequently dips to near 30 FPS on PS4, which is what I played on originally. In either case, there were zombies that would frequently move at lower frame rates and the blood and gore effects didn't really look as nice as they did in RE2 Remake. Now you may be asking, why would a game that came out a year after RE2 Remake perform worse? Well, that's because Capcom outsourced this this game, while RE2, was made in-house. These games were basically made side by side with each other, and it's safe to assume Resident Evil Village was also being made alongside these two. These guys had a lot on their plate, and they needed help for Resident Evil 3, so they went to another studio for help. While I don't think outsourcing is necessarily a bad thing, it's just my opinion that Capcom does their best work in-house. I think this game should have had another year in the oven so they could iron out the performance issues and add some more content. Because as I'm sure you know, 
This game is really short. My first playthrough was about eight hours long on hardcore, but my standard playthrough was just over four. I didn't realize how short this was until I beat all the other Resident Evil games, which all took me at least 14 hours to beat. And while Resident Evil 2's campaigns aren't that long either, they have a ton of replayability in different scenarios to explore, whereas this game has one path. This is personal preference, but another thing that really bothered me was the lack of defensive items. Defensive items that were present in RE2 Remake were replaced with button mash and QTEs, but these didn't necessarily work for me. And while in RE2 you could use defensive items to get away or even kill in some instances, you have to mash the buttons here to just not take as much damage as you would have if you didn't press them. Which is kinda lame. And now let's talk about one of the biggest disappointments for me. Something that I was really looking forward to in Resident Evil 3 specifically that did not hold up at all. This is also something that left a very bad impression on me and ruined my first experience. And that thing is Nemesis. Over the years, I've heard many things about Nemesis. His iconic stars line, the fucking rocket launcher, the ultimate tyrant hellbent on killing stars members by any means. This dude was in fucking Marvel vs. Capcom 3. He had to be important. Nemesis was supposed to be the follow-up to Mr. X, and in a way, he does just that, but the way he's presented here just didn't work for me. First of all, this dude is just a giant set piece. He does not follow you around really in the game, except for, you guessed it, Raccoon City. And even then, it doesn't last very long. He can sprint at you, catch you with a tentacle, and can even teleport to you. But once that section is over, that's it. He doesn't show up and chase you in-game like that for the rest of the game. Everything else is a pre-scripted set piece. I also have to mention that if you hit him with a single grenade, he goes down instantly. His first real boss fight was him using a flamethrower, which was actually pretty cool. But his rocket launcher sequence is so short that if you blink, you're gonna miss it. There were even times where he locked on to me and it looked like he purposely missed me just to add false tension. Once you get to the clock tower, he turns into stage two nemesis, which is the form of a giant dog. Hi doggy. This boss fight is so obnoxious. He has way too much health, the dodging can get weird in his attacks, and he runs around in a circle so you can conveniently hit him with a mine grenade. This fight isn't necessarily hard, it just takes way too long. Now what really annoyed me was the boss fight after this. It's literally the exact same fight, except this time when Nemesis runs around, he'll play hide and seek behind a generator that you have to shoot. Now this was a problem for both playthroughs, and especially my hardcore experience, but I fucking hate how zombies spawn in this area. It's bad enough that this boss refuses to go down, but now you have to worry about a bunch of random goons killing you too. And trust me, these fuckers killed me a lot. Arguably more times than the actual fucking boss. I'm fucking done. No, fuck that. For me, this is the golden standard of what a bad boss fight looks like. If you put in random enemies to distract you from the actual fucking boss fight, there's something wrong with your boss fight and it needs to be fixed. This is more acceptable in a game like Batman, where the combat is tailored to fight off multiple enemies quickly and efficiently. But here, you either ignore them and risk getting bit and dying, or use resources fighting them off with the possibility that Nemesis is gonna get a cheap shot off you. In my first playthrough, I barely made it out of this fight and we still have one more fight left. I will admit, it is pretty badass. I also kinda wish Jill said something cooler at the end though. I really like her I'll give you stars line, but she said that earlier as a callback to the original Resident Evil game. I don't know, I just wish she had a better line. And finishing off my hardcore playthrough, the game decided to kill me one last time, when I thought I had to properly aim and shoot Nikolai at the end. I went for the fucking head. Game just had to kill me one last fucking time. It's funny now, but I thought it was the perfect representation on my thoughts here. So after all of this bitching, it sounds like I absolutely despised this game. But honestly, I still enjoyed it, especially after I gave it another chance on standard. I think that the first few sections are really cool, but the game just loses steam really fast. The technical problems, the horrible boss fights, and the short as hell runtime are very glaring and important issues that hindered my enjoyment especially when the rest of the series is really solid. I know there are some people that really like this game, and I think that's cool, 
but I just don't feel that way here. It's unfortunate, but I'm gonna have to give Resident Evil 3 a 4 out of 10. <sighs> well, that was definitely something. But hey, at least it's not as bad as Resident Evil 4, am I right? That game is so bad, they're also remaking that one, right? <laughs> I'm just joking. Resident Evil 4 is amazing. Please don't hurt me. Now, we all know this game is good. I would even go as far as to say this is probably one of the greatest video games of all time. And I know a million people have talked about this game already and why it's so good, but I wasn't able to do that for the past 16 years, so now it's my turn. Oh, Jesus Christ! Assholes. First of all, the tone is goofy as fuck, and I love it. Compared to the rest of the series, this is definitely the most lighthearted. Leon is going about his mission like he doesn't give a fuck about any of these ganados. He's constantly making jokes and being a smartass, especially to the main villains who are taking themselves way too seriously. I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? The fuck you say to me, you little shit! The best and most obvious comparison I can make is that he's acting like Dante, which is funny because one of the earlier drafts of Resident Evil 4 turned into the first Devil May Cry game. What I also love about Leon in this game is that even though he carries himself as an efficient agent who is getting the job done and saving the day, he's still a dumbass. Like, look at this scene. Long time no see. Ada. Leon, how did you not know that was Ada? Did you really not recognize her because she had fucking sunglasses on, you fucking idiot? It's hilarious to me because this game looks really good and the story has Leon put in a very serious situation. Then we go into a cutscene and everyone is saying dumb shit like this. No thanks, bro. Like you, I'm American. No way, Leon. Way? <laughs> Where's everyone going? Bingo? I think the game's tone is summed up perfectly when Leon asks if everyone is going to play bingo, then the title card drops in a serious and overdramatic way. Even the in-game QTEs can get ridiculous, like the laser hallway, the Krauser knife fight, and even sitting in a fucking chair. Leon, Ashley is being tortured right now, stop dicking around! I also love how there's like four fucking villains here. We have a tyrant, a munchkin, a rival character, I'm American, and a cult leader who doesn't like cliche Hollywood movies for some reason. Each one is so over the top and ridiculous in their own way, and it actually makes them super memorable. I can't tell you a single thing about Nikolai or Birkin, but I could make a whole video about Salazar. Hmm, where's the satisfying sound of one's impalement? Don't fall for this old trick. I love how once you defeat them, a new one shows up to take their place, getting their own spotlight to shine. And they even have their own weaknesses too. Mendez is weak to incendiary and explosive grenades, Krauser is weak to knives, and Salazar is weak to rockets. Bingo! Now the gameplay is also amazing. This was the first in the series to adopt the third person perspective, putting you closer to the action and horror. Now I do have to say, this isn't really much of a horror game, but more of a survival action game with horror elements. The music is so loud and immersive, I would get tense when I hear the first few notes, even if I didn't see any enemies. The combat is more about precise aiming rather than unloading everything you have onto your enemies. Headshots are based on skill, and shooting enemies a certain way will lead to a QTE prompt to do additional damage and even hit multiple enemies at once. You can even shoot enemy projectiles out of the air if you're accurate enough. And even though the combat is more action-based, it still has tension in each encounter. You can't move while aiming and reloading, so if you're not clearly managing your clip size and run out of ammo at the wrong spot, you're going to get punished for it. Enemies also come in huge packs, and the opening in the village is the perfect representation of what to expect. There's also a wide variety of enemy types that all have different weapons, weak points, and multiple attacks. They can even sidestep your shots while you're aiming. They're also really memorable. They all have their own dialogue that makes them menacing, from the Ganado Spanish to the zombie cult followers, and don't even get me started on the regenerators. <laughs> And even though you can't quickly swap between weapons, I thought it was a clever idea to go into the inventory and strategize on your next move. It was like playing a chess game, weighing my options to find the best way to survive each encounter. On a side note, introducing this new system for inventory management was such a good idea. Being able to organize and place items a certain way while also having a ton of space, but still somehow managing to not be able to hold everything 
is amazing. It's oddly satisfying to have an organized inventory. Just like when I'm organizing laundry and I have all the shirts and pants folded nicely in different drawers until you start getting lazy and say fuck it, I'll just stuff it wherever. This game also introduces the best character in Resident Evil. The Merchant. That's right, this mysterious guy will show up periodically throughout the game and sell you various items and upgrades to weapons and your briefcase. In this game, you don't really find weapons. There are some scattered throughout, but a majority of the time you're going to be saving up money you make from killing enemies and exploring to buy better weapons. You can also sell treasures you pick up along the way, and if you experiment and combine some of them together, they'll be worth even more. One of the cool things about this is that you can make the game more convenient for yourself if you save up for rockets, but you can also upgrade your weapons to make them more powerful, have more ammo, and reload faster. And by the end, if you max out your inventory space, you're able to hold almost one of each gun type with ammo, health, and attachments. A majority of these weapons are optional too, and I love how you can mix and match to find your favorite guns and trade the weaker ones in for more powerful versions once they're available. But all this new stuff that was introduced here doesn't deteriorate from what Resident Evil is about. The game is constantly finding new ways to keep you on your toes, and incorporating QTEs into cutscenes was a great way to do that. You think you're safe once a cutscene starts playing, so you relax, set the controller down, smoke a joint, and then BAM! you're dead. Even in combat, you learn to kill enemies quickly, and headshots are an efficient way to do that. But if you do too much damage to an enemy, especially to their heads, they'll pop off and become an even more deadly enemy. I think now would be a great time to bring up another thing that makes this game amazing, and that's the adaptive difficulty. Adaptive difficulty is a hidden feature where the game will judge your performance in the game you're playing and adjust the difficulty to suit your playstyle. If you're dying over and over again, the game rewards you with more items and less aggression from enemies. But if you're breezing through the game, it'll make enemies more aggressive and harder to kill. You're probably not going to notice it because of how precise and subtle it is, but one of the best examples that I can visually show you is in the water room. If you're performing super well up until this point, there will be two enemies with crossbows on top, but if you repeatedly die, they disappear making it slightly easier to get through the room. I should also mention this is exclusive to the normal difficulty. Playing on professional is having the adaptive difficulty set to max the whole way through, and you'll have to just get good. And while I thought professional was ball crushingly difficult with a total death count of 130, I only got actively frustrated on the last mission with Mike before the final boss. There is non-stop fire with the helicopters and turrets and explosions, and this more than anything leans heavily into the action element. But this is the only time that I really felt like this, so I'm willing to give it a pass. Unless they do it again. On normal, this feels like a victory lap where you can go crazy and have fun before the final boss, but on professional, it was the final test, where the game threw everything in the kitchen sink and more before I let you finish, and I felt so accomplished when I did. This game is also very straightforward compared to the games before it, and the level design is a lot more linear. There isn't really a whole lot of backtracking except for like one area. I don't have a preference one way or the other. I think RE1's backtracking was awful, I thought 2 and 3 were fine, but the linear path of RE4 was pretty nice. Which means there weren't any puzzles that required backtracking, and the puzzles that are present here are mainly just finding keys on boss enemies to progress to the next door, and the occasional brain teaser, which is standard for Resident Evil, and something I do like to see to give a break from the survival horror action. Now, one of the things I was worried about when starting this game was Ashley. Ashley is who you're here to rescue, and very early into the game, you find her and she follows you around while you're trying to navigate and escape. She has her own health bar with no way to defend herself, so if she dies or gets captured and taken away, it's game over. Look, there's a gate here. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> Before I started, I've heard all about Ashley and how annoying she is, and how the game suddenly turns into an escort mission where you have to protect her and how she dies so easily and gets captured all the time, but I honestly didn't mind her all that much. In fact, having an extra person to keep track of actually made it more challenging, but in a good way. I had to get creative and tell her to wait in certain spots while I dealt with a wave of enemies, and she did a much better job of ducking appropriately when I was taking a shot. I'd say that the biggest challenge I had with Ashley was the infamous water room on Professional. It wasn't really that difficult, but it was challenging to fight a never-ending wave of enemies that are going after both you and Ashley at the same time, especially when Ashley is required to be on her own. So it became less about unloading everything I could to picking my battles and finding the most efficient way to beat the section. Also, I was expecting her to be around for the entire time, but I think she's really only with you for like 
less than 50% of the game? If anyone knows exactly what the percentage is, please let me know in the comments below. I think if she was there for the whole time, it would have been a little obnoxious, but I think the amount of time spent with her was reasonable. There were times where her yelling did get annoying for me, but I made sure she learned her lesson. <laughs> So that was Resident Evil 4. It shouldn't come as a surprise, but I really loved this game and it easily became one of my favorite of the series and one of my favorite video games, period. I don't use this term often, but I think this game truly is a masterpiece. There's a lot more that I can talk about and if I'm being honest, I could probably make a video this length on Resident Evil 4 alone and still have more to say. There's so much extra shit too, like the Bottle Cat minigames, the extra campaigns with Ada that I haven't tried yet, and Mercenaries mode a zombie wave horde mode with five playable characters that all function differently. I've heard people say this is where the downfall of Resident Evil as a survival horror series started and deviated into the action territory, but I disagree. This game is borderline flawless and I think this is a game everyone should play at least once in their lifetime. 10 out of 10, the perfect Resident Evil. So that was the first four games in the Resident Evil series and we have four more to cover, but this video is already super long and one of those games isn't even out yet. So we're gonna take a break here. Plus at the very end of the next video, we're gonna rank these games from worst to best and see how they hold up next to each other. Now I gotta go prepare for Tall Lady's arrival and all of the simps I'm gonna have to bunk because of it. So thank you everybody for watching and I'll see you guys soon. Manda! Manda, where's my bunking stick?